We're going to call to order the Monday, March 6th, 2017 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, thank you for coming this evening. Before we begin tonight, I want to welcome our newest member, Gene Benson. Thank you. And welcome to the board. I'm sure you'll find it educational, informative, and lots of fun. And lots of work. <laughs> We're glad to have you. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, <clears throat> first on our agenda this evening is as relates to um, the 43 Summer Street um, EDR hearing special permit docket 3522 received correspondence from the applicant attorney requesting a continuance. Uh, kind of an open-ended idea. Did we get a date from Bob? No, we've not gotten a date. I think um, one of the things they wanted to do before they came back before the board had to do with environmental testing um, because that came up the preschool which is two doors away was very concerned about that the condition of the, of the, um, the ground so they are doing like a second round of testing right now I think which they will have the results of before they come back and as well as other new documents new site plan and other plans how far along are they for. on some of the documents we requested? I Lindsay don't know. Plan, et I've asked them a number of times if they know when they'll be able to come back, and they haven't given me okay. any date at all. So I think what I would do, I don't know if we need a motion okay. for this. We can grant a general continuance um, not to expire. That, that, that there their application won't be automatically approved within the 90 days prescribed right. by the statute. Uh, we have an agreement with them that they'll come back when they're ready. Before the 90 days expires. Before, okay. Right. And, the, and this is the only correspondence that we've received to Laura's point. Okay. So we don't have any sign. I mean, we could choose a date, which in this case I would suggest May, the first meeting in May, I guess because of the timing of everything. I'd suggest that as a target date and let them know that we'd like to have them back, but not to move forward with any publication until we have that Correct. confirmed right. with them. And also, the, all the meetings during town meeting will be abbreviated, so. Okay. All right, do we need a motion for that, or is that just I a I would general? suggest a motion. I hereby motion to continue this uh, uh, docket number 3522 to uh, May, uh, project the date in May. Um, I'll close up for I think you should reference the 90-day period. Yeah, within the 90 days prescribed by Chapter 40A, Section 9. 90 days from what? From, from when you submitted. Yeah. 90 days from the original date. Is that, I mean, he's giving you permission in this letter to not stay within the 90 days. The um, second to the bottom paragraph. That was how I read it. Yeah, so. I, yeah. It's supposed to be 90 days from when they had the hearing. So right. we would, so I would certainly be. I would suggest, a good suggested term. we will have meetings between now and then, obviously. I would suggest that we continue this to the first meeting in May. If it starts to get close, then we ask for at least Bob, to come in and just put something in writing to avoid the expiration of that 90-day period. Okay. Do you know the date? Um, no. So does Ken have to amend or what? Withdraw his motion and put it on the table. No one seconds it, right? No. All right. I withdraw it. You can amend it. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> You're doing what? Great. Uh, I motion uh, to extend uh, the hearing to to May, or first available date in May. The first available date. Uh, Docket number 3522. Um, with uh, um, understanding that the nine day ex ex uh, expiration is, uh, is agreed upon by them. Let's say the nine day expiration period has stayed. Yeah, the nine day has stayed. Yes, sir. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, good. <coughs> yeah, it's all new. Okay, next up on the agenda is a discussion with Karen Thomas Allier. Apologize if I. All right. Um, one of the proponents of Town Meeting Warrant, Article 9, she had 
uh, emailed Jenny and David and myself mm -hmm. and asked to have a discussion with the board regarding buffer zones and her town meeting warrant article. So Karen, if you can come up and introduce yourself for the record, have a seat in front of us. You can drag a more comfortable chair up if you'd like. Um, so my name is Karen Thomas Allier. Can you my address? And yes. Oh, uh, 157 Newport Street. Um, so, yes, yeah, so just a little bit of background. Um, I think you are probably familiar with this issue, but just so everyone's on this, the same page. So, when um, registered marijuana dispensaries were approved, medical marijuana dispensaries were approved by the state in 2012, there was a 500 foot buffer zone around places where children <coughs> commonly congregate. That buffer zone was intended to be included with the zoning rule that was passed by Arlington a couple years ago where we limited RMDs to the business districts of the town. <coughs> However, the state ruled over the summer that we had inadvertently eliminated the state buffer zone when we zoned RMDs for the business districts. And as far as I'm aware, that was not the intention of anybody within the Arlington to get rid of those buffer zones. So the poor point of this warrant article is just to put back what we wanted to be there all along. Um, the language that we used was that from uh, the town of Burlington's buffer zone, just because it's a little bit more specific than the states, where you know, the state says places where children commonly congregate is rather vague. Um, so we used the language from Burlington. Um, and that language is identical to a substitute motion that was proposed by Jason Cofield last fall. However, at the time, it was ruled that this substitute motion was too different from a different motion proposed by the marijuana industry. So it didn't go to the town meeting because it was too different from what did go to the town meeting. Um, sorry, this is confusing with lots of warrants being proposed over the years. Um, so at any rate, um, I've had discussions with Christine about what she thinks, um, what the Board of Health thinks, and the, the Director of Health think about what the buffer zone should be. And so the Board of Health has proposed revised language, um, and I will let the Director of Health speak about what that language entails. Um, but just to make sure everyone's aware of the differences between what we're proposing and what the marijuana industry put on the town meeting agenda last fall. Um, the one last fall would have allowed a registered medical marijuana dispensary to be next door to preschools and would have allowed them to be next door to athletic fields and playgrounds. So that's the major difference between what pro we're proposing and what was voted on last fall. Um, so I think if I may speak. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, thank you. So Christine Bongiorno, Health and Human Services Director. I represent the Board of Health. Um, so Karen had come to the, the last Board of Health meeting, and the Board had asked that I work with Karen and the um, proponents of the Warrant Article um, 9. Um, so looking at the Warrant Article that was originally proposed, um, and in discussions with um, Town Council, it appeared as if um, the proposed article may, may have been too comprehensive. Um, it may have potentially zoned out the use in town. So looking at what are the most sensitive public health and public safety receptors in town, we came up with the list that you have in front of you. Um, working closely, obviously, with the police department um, and others in town to look at where do we see areas in town that could potentially be a problem for um, this type of use in town. We obviously don't want to see a facility pop up across the street from the high school next door to um, Arlington Catholic. I think those are the, those are the, the, the areas that we were looking at. Um, so what you have in front of you is a proposal that we feel um, not only protects the, the public health and safety of the community, it also um, you know, al still allows for our sites to operate. To, um, as you see from the map here, um, the dark red sites are the sites that are still available. So as you see from this map, the color map, um, the gray areas are the actual buffer zones around the sensitive sites. Um, we came up with a list of addresses. I used um, both licensed facilities through the Department of Early Education as well as, um, so we have group homes, athletic fields, so athletic fields where permitted events occur for children um, through the rec department. We used 
addresses from a, a number of various um, organizations. So those are all plotted on the map. So as you can see, there are still sites available. Um, so it wouldn't essentially be zoning this out of town. Um, so there are sites still available in the Heights, in the center, as well as in the east. Um, I think, you know, we did look at this strategically um, from, as I said, both a public health and a public safety perspective. Um, we feel as if it is um, very fair and, 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 a, and a good proposal to move forward um, with your approval to town meeting. Um, with me here tonight is also Chief Fred Ryan, uh, who um, has worked over the years with me closely on uh, marijuana issues in town, as well as uh, you know, a, a whole host of other drug issues in town, both within the youth population as well as the, the general um, adult population. So if I may turn it over to Chief Ryan to give his perspective on this issue. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, thank Christine. You. Good evening, honorable members of the board. Fred Ryan, uh, police chief, thank you uh, for giving me the time. And at the risk of sounding a little bit cynical, uh, I've looked at the data, and um, you know there are 168 people who uh, are certified to receive medical marijuana in Arlington. So we have to assume then any entrepreneur who sets up in our community will draw upon a demographic from outside of Arlington people who we are unfamiliar with and, and likely will um, come to Arlington to acquire their marijuana. And, you know, our concern is that uh, without the buffer zone, we uh, could potentially have a, a, a demographic coming to Arlington that wouldn't otherwise come to Arlington to acquire their marijuana and bring with them other people who may not have, uh, because remember, with the security plan with, with dis dispensaries, only the person certified can actually enter the premises. So anybody they travel to Arlington with cannot enter the premises. They have to wait outside, wait in a car, what have you. And when and these are cash businesses and 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 um, delivery is also an option. And the police department is concerned about the impact of the quality of life in and around uh, dispensaries in the future. And this just makes good common sense. You know, it, it speaks to our values in our community with a great education system and and uh, our investment in our uh, education and, and youth sports and, and just the general quality of life. And I whole, wholeheartedly um, support this, this Warren article. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> just to be clear, this is not a public hearing tonight. This was uh, the proponent asking to have a conversation with the board. Our public hearing on this will happen next week. This is really just a, a backbiting informational uh, courtesy to somebody who took the time to, to put a Warren article together and asked to be included on the agenda. So we won't be taking a vote tonight. This is really just a, as an informal discussion. I thank Chief Ryan and, and Director Bongiorno for coming tonight. But this is a good time for members of the board to ask questions of anybody that's here ahead of the public meeting next week, public hearing next week. Ken. I do have one question. I appreciate uh, this color vision makes a lot more sense now because I could not really understand the black and white before. You, you're saying that there are zones that are still available for uh, a legitimate um, uh, marijuana distribution, uh, medical marijuana distribution plant, right? What happens in the future if someone all of a sudden puts a, uh, a school right next to it so that spot will also disappear then? Or are we establishing these red zones that you say right here are the areas that you can put mer mer medical marijuana? Now it's been by the zoning article saying it's zoned for those areas. If someone chooses to put a daycare center or a um, um, you know one of the lists you've put there, right, it will not exclude that area anymore. So I think the intent of the law is to protect the health and safety of children. So if there's a facility that children are using, the intent of the law is to protect the children in that facility. I realize that. I, I, so, I totally agree so, with you there. So, I, so I'm, I'm answering your question. So yes, in the future, if a new school is sited in a particular location where there is not presently a, a marijuana dispensary, Presumably, if the school is aware that a dispensary is there, they wouldn't cho choose to locate there. But if a school opens up in a place, then you're right. The 500 feet around that school would no longer be available. 
And I would only add that, you know, the original state regs called for the 500-foot buffer zone. And some of this is uncharted territory. I agree with that. That's why I'm asking Evolving people. law. Um, this is a very difficult question I'm trying to ask you because I, I don't want to get to the point where, you know, today we say uh, these four zones are okay, but then by our actions, a year from now or two years from now, we have no zones available because of a daycare center or um, a park or, or so forth. And now there is, I mean, I believe the town voted overwhelmingly 68% to support this medical marijuana, not recreational. That's a totally separate thing, okay? So I think the town is saying, we're supportive of this medical use and purely a medical use. Now I'm talking now, okay? That we should have the ability to have some place to put it. And I agree with you. Appropriate place is is critical. Well, so, to okay. clar to clarify to some extent, just for, for anybody who has questions, this is not a retroactive statute. This is not a retroactive bylaw, so it won't impact the RMB that's already been approved. No, so there's one coming there. It, it, right, but I just think that's important to put out on the table. Mm -hmm. it's, but respectfully, it's if I may, it, it gets us back to the baseline with the original regs. Right. And all the issues you raise would have presented themselves had we not inadvertently um, done what we did to exclude the, the, the buffer zone. So it's just getting us back to the baseline. That was good public policy to begin with. And I might say the, the people of this town voted to legalize medical marijuana in an abstract state. They did not vote on the particular question of where to situate a medical marijuana dispensary in this town. I think if you ask the people of this town to vote on that specific question, you'd get a very different answer. No, I, I, I would agree with you there. But if we get into a point where we put this in and don't have some sort of fair deal where there's no, there will be no place that can go. So I think practically that's not going to happen. If you look at the map, it's very unlikely that a new school is going to open up within 500 feet of the areas that are dark red. Maybe not a school, but what about a daycare center? So I think that's also unlikely. I mean, if you look at especially the areas in Arlington Heights, there, there's no place to put a daycare center around those locations. And then, I mean, the other place in along Pleasant Street, you know, there, there's no place you can put a daycare center there right now. So I, I, while your question can be asked in the abstract, I think in, in the practical case of what's on this map, it's not going to happen. Um. But, and then even still in the abstract, I mean, the point of the mm -hmm. law is to protect the children. So you're saying that if suddenly the population of children in the town increases and we need more schools to accommodate this town that we should start sacrificing their health? No, I didn't say that either. I'm just saying that if we allow certain spaces for this to happen, there should be all spaces that the school can go into or daycare center can go into. But if they choose to go in that area there, it doesn't affect someone else that's already there or someone that's, I mean, right now you're, you're designating five zones for this. Well, these aren't, they're not designating five. the zones, they're just examples of, but, but, of what's available. But those are the five, five zones that are available. You know, maybe I'm way off here. I'm just trying to play the advocate on the other side right now, just to see, to be fair. Okay. Well, and the devil's advocate to that is that one of the existing schools could move as well, right? I mean, it's, it's a zoning for the situation on the ground, right? I mean, you look at what you have there and you protect what's there. Right? Children who are going to school are there, so you protect them. I'm not going to I'm just trying to express something yeah. to okay? And I'll just leave it at that because I think <coughs> it's kind of, you know, we can debate this most of the day. Go ahead, David. So, uh, you know, I, we, we granted the special permit uh, for the proposed Water Street facility. And um, I know that was just one one piece of the permitting process that um, that proponent has been engaged in. So I I just want to understand uh, uh, is is that in fact done or is is there potential here that 
that that could change the siting. That's done. That's, that's, that's okay. Something that's, that they're moving forward. They're getting a board of health permit probably by July uh, to operate. More okay. in the process of reviewing the security plans, as we speak. Yeah, and and we also look pretty closely at their security precautions. Mm -hmm. All right, so this, re this really would only uh, affect uh, uh, any additional dispensaries that were proposed uh, for the town, and they could, uh, under, this, uh, under this proposed buffer zone um, change, they would only be able to sit be sited in the areas indicated in dark red on the map. And we have 168 people in the community eligible to get medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. How many children do we have? Five thousand. Well, Where do those 168 people go now? Salem, um, Cambridge. Cambridge. And so Cambridge is the next closest dispensary, I suppose. Are there any proposed? sites in any other neighboring communities in, in Burlington, Lexington? Somerville, I believe there'll be two. Um, Cambridge, I know of Needham, Boston, Quincy, uh, Salem, um, so. okay. no, no more currently proposed in Arlington, though? Uh, no, but to be honest with you, the Board of Health does receive phone calls um, from firms that are interested in moving to town. Um, you know, they, obviously they're sent over to the selectmen. There is a process. The Board of Health is, you know, later on in the process, so they are sent to other. Mm -hmm. the, the reason I'm, I'm going down this line of questioning is I'm wondering how many more than those 168 may start to fill into town once this one is open and whether there'll be the demand for an additional RMD in one of these other districts. Um, so the current um, facility will be doing home delivery. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if somebody is unable to access um, the, the one in the center, they obviously um, could have a delivery. Okay. I probably asked this question back in the original hearing back in the fall, but what, what's the criteria for getting a prescription and being able to access one of these facilities? I know that's not something that the Board of Health necessarily mm -hmm. sets, but I imagine you know the answer. Um, there is a, a laundry list of conditions that um, one must uh, have in order to, to receive a, um, a recommendation from a physician. I, I have heard that it is pretty easy to get a card. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I can't speak to how easy that is. I, I haven't obtained one myself. Um, but it is a recommendation by a, a particular physician. That, um, I believe that there will there will be um, a recommendation by the current uh, Water Street facility. You know which physicians they can you know people can get okay. recommendations. Okay. David, anything further? Just do we have <coughs> any <coughs> idea um, what the interplay might end up being between uh, this and uh, and changes related to recreational marijuana? So this, I believe the state's still trying to figure that, that out. Um, I do know that um, question four did um, outline the ability for medical facilities to convert over to rec sell recreationally. Um, I know that the town, um, you know, the Board of Health is really in favor of um, putting forward a, a vote to the, to the community to, to try to ban recreational marijuana. Um, I think that there's so much to learn from other states. I don't think um, jumping into this right away. I think the Board of Health is really um, interested in, in, in sort of letting the community take a vote to, to take a step back. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, it, it's hard to say. The state is still trying to, to, to navigate that. Um, I know that there has been um, a shift and in, in maybe the timeline has um, increased slightly, so it's not going to happen as quickly <laughs> as we originally thought. But I know the entrepreneur's vision is one line for medical, <coughs> one line for recreation. Um, I thought when we approved the medical marijuana uh, facility in what is it Water Street? Water mm -hmm. Street. Okay. That we we put a provision in there saying that if they were to also do recreational, they would have to come back to the board for approvals. 
I thought we had put something like that in there. That's that's a condition that's in there, I do believe. Yes. And I, yep, I, there's a condition. I also recall that <coughs> testimony saying that that was not in their right. plans. That's what I remember too. Yeah. So is, is that, that can change. But. That, that has changed. So yeah. um, my most recent conversation with the well, that's interesting. Um, attorneys, you know, I, I did explain that the Board of Health is um, in favor of pushing forward for a, a local vote, and um, they said that they wouldn't. They wouldn't say that they're not interested because it is a business, um, and that that you know whatever decision was made by the town, they're still moving forward with the medical. Um, but obviously, they would uh, be interested in recreational if that, if that were. Mm -hmm. I thought we said not on that site, not on that approval or that special permit. Yeah. So question four doesn't allow local the local government to take any action to prohibit a facility to become recreational. So unfortunately. That's that's one of the issues that's being um, discussed at the AG's level because I think that's something to take local control away um, on that that particular issue. It just wasn't it didn't make too much sense. So I think um, you know there's definitely a lot a lot to learn over the next you know I'd say six months. Uh, I know town council is trying to figure out what what steps we can take as a community, um, but I do know that the the local control in question four was was eliminated. We we have very little control. But we, but we could, but we do control the right to have medical marijuana. And I thought it was one of the conditions. It's a special condition of their permit that we ask them to come back here in the event that they're considering there's any consideration for recreational marijuana at that facility. Then they would have to go through that process anyway, mm -hmm. even though, as Christine has noted, there's not final regulation, so we don't have all of the guidance that we need in order to move forward we know that they will inevitably have to come back to us because it would, it would be an amendment to the special permit regardless mm -hmm. of what the use is that we're talking about. They, any amendment to a special permit would have to come back. And then I just want to say one more thing is that um, one of the articles for um, special town meeting, which is in your packet, is the moratorium. Mm -hmm. And that would basically buy us, I think, about three more months. Um, so, you know, more time to, to plan, essentially, in the absence of clear guidance. Um, I guess one more point I was going to make really quickly is um, I, my, my understanding, again, of recreational marijuana is that if, if it were to move forward in town and say even after a vote and the vote was that people wish for that use to remain in town, only one facility could open up potentially? Or is that... You don't I'm not sure. Okay. So that, that's my understanding of having it spoken with town council about this as well. Um, it's one-fifth of the number of liquor licenses? The liquor licenses. So my understanding anyway from that conversation so that would, be. <coughs> it would be one. Okay. So. Okay. Andy? Uh, Chief Ryan, I just want to, I'm glad you're here. What, if you compare it, you've got a, a CVS, a, pharmacy, you've got liquor stores, and now you've got this medical marijuana dispensary. How do you compare those, and what are the various dangers of each one of those so that we can, that I can put it into context? What's dangerous about a medical marijuana facility, and how do you see outside influences, and how does that all work? What's the metric of the danger that you see as the uh, chief of police? Yeah, interesting question. You know, one analogy I can make is, you know, there's, um, you know, we have uh, hot spots with group homes, with um, particularly one in the Heights, and we know that the convenience store nearby, although they, we work with them, Christine's offices work with them to try to prevent them from selling tobacco to, to children, um, but it's, tobacco is getting diverted to children, we know that in Arlington Heights, um, and my concern is uh, diversion of marijuana from those who uh, possess a medical marijuana card into the hands of our children. And Christine has some interesting youth risk behavior survey data that uh, indicates um, um, some trends around the perception of uh, use of marijuana among children being more acceptable. Um, but you know, if you look at the demographics of those who, who have a medical marijuana card, uh, the overwhelming majority are between 18 and 50. And there are only um, uh, nine over the age of 70. <clears throat> and so our concern is not only with this group, but those who come to Arlington from outside of Arlington with a card, then diverting 
their medical marijuana and profiting uh, uh, from it by diverting it to children in the, in the community. Now obviously, um, recreational, um, what, if and when recreational marijuana comes to Arlington, that will have an impact as well. But it's that diversion piece. And the second piece you worry about is, is the delivery, although it's, a, I'll admit it, it is a pretty good security plan. I think you all have seen that as well. Um, but I worry about, you know, cash and, and marijuana are, are valuable commodities in the community in, in the delivery setting. And, and, you know, I can't predict what the challenges will be, but I worry about the impact that it will have on our neighborhoods and I worry about the diversion into the hands of our children. So if you're going to a CVS and buying Vicodin, couldn't you have the same exchange with somebody who wants to buy it? And we have that uh, difficulty in the community now. Uh, one uh, popular uh, uh, drug of choice is Clonopin, where some kids have Clonopin prescriptions and, and Clonopins are getting diverted into children's hands and we know about that. So that exists just the way you know, people wait outside the liquor store when you were a kid to see if you could get somebody to buy you a six-pack of beer, kind of thing. Well, now they use social media. <laughs> <laughs> so we're dating ourselves. So all of that is controlled by you, obviously, by the police department, and you have ways to do that, and you have a, a way to look at it. You've got liquor stores. You've got drug stores. You've got now RMD. Is the location that you are putting it is that the best way that you feel to avoid the kind of interaction that you're talking about? Well, I think in terms of, you see, our focus is prevention. You know, um, whether it be sale of alcohol to children or tobacco to children, we would prefer to work with the merchant to prevent that from occurring rather than playing gotcha. Right. And we've done a lot of work with merchants around that very issue. You may see when we go out and do uh, alcohol stings, we advertise in advance that we're going to be doing alcohol stings. And a lot of folks will say, why would you do that? You're not going to catch anybody. And we say, well, that's exactly what we want. We want zero violations. So if folks know that the pressure is on, they're likely to ramp up their compliance efforts. And so the point I guess I'm trying to make is, you know, we can work with merchants regardless of what they're selling, around compliance and, 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 um, and getting proactive about preventing violations rather than playing gotcha after the stuff is landed in the, in the hands of children. That's, that's our philosophical approach to it with tobacco, with Christine's office, alcohol obviously, and the same thing. I've had these conversations with the dispensary that's planning to come to town. That, you know, we are willing to work hand in hand with them to prevent the diver diversion type activity that I'm describing, I don't think that will be 100% effective. And that's what concerns me. Do you think it helps to push away from downtown areas and so forth as outlined in this thing? Or is it, I thought at one point it was stated that, well, you know, you want it where you're going to be most, the most business is going on, the most, act, most activity on a daily basis. Such you know that that's where you're going to be anyway. That's where you're monitoring. That's where lights need to be turned on, uh, as opposed to going farther out where the lights are lower. And right. So that it, that was a question because I, it was in my mind because I thought we talked about it a while ago. Um, yeah, I think the theory there was we have a lot of good business people in town, and the peer pressure uh, among the merchants would have a positive impact on preventing some of the things that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, with large sums of drugs and money, I worry about a robbery. And, you know, in close proximity to a place where there are children um, could, could be a recipe for some uh, real devastating consequences. And to the extent that we go back to the original regs with the 500-foot uh, buffer zone, I feel uh, that it's good public policy for our community to, to, uh, to take that approach. It would be helpful to the police. In, in preventing that diversion and an and injury to our uh, our beloved children. Thanks. Gene. Can you talk a little bit about how this diversion happens? Because I'm not in that world. Yeah. And I don't really understand how somebody buying medical marijuana because they have a need for it ends up with young people in the community. Yeah. So, you know, like alcohol, um, um, 
we expect that marijuana will wind up in the hands of children uh, coming from medical marijuana dispensaries. You know, like the example that was given, um, apparently some of you guys when your children used to wait around the liquor store. I just heard about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but, you know, a simple example. A carload comes in from um, Belmont. One, one of the young men has, has a medical marijuana card, goes in, acquires the, the marijuana, comes out, gets in the car, they go to a nearby park. Now they're using marijuana in the park. And um, in order to pay for more marijuana, sell a little bit, and that funds the acquisition of, 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 uh, of more marijuana. It's what happens with alcohol. It's what happens with uh, with illicit drugs now, um, and we would expect that some level of diversion. And you know, and I talked a lot with the um, entrepreneur going into uh, Water Street. Um, you know, I, I want to know how they're um, screening their employees because there's a lot of the diversion comes from within <coughs> as well. And so we want to work with them uh, around preventing. Uh, um, employees who might have some um, some criminal desire to divert it out into the out into the field. And what age children would this be diverted to? Like five year olds or seven year olds? Or I, I, what age like is the target age for this? So our youth risk behavior survey, um, twelve to seventeen year olds typically mm -hmm. um, would be the first to start using um, marijuana. I mean, obviously they're using it younger, but not at higher, not hi at high enough levels. Can, can you explain a little bit then the connection between proximity of location and the diversion? Because people are driving to the park from wherever it is. It doesn't matter if it's 500 feet or 1,000 feet. They're driving somewhere else for it. If they're doing it on social media, it doesn't matter where they buy it. So explain a little bit to me the connection between proximity and the diversion. So uh, we would expect that some folks would use public transportation um, to get the dis to the dispensary mm -hmm. and then commute by foot and then back out from the dispensary and mm -hmm. head back toward and perhaps use along the way. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's during that acquisition of, of uh, of the marijuana and then the uh, commute back to public transportation where it's highly likely that they'll use along the way and then there's opportunity right there for uh, impact of quality of life. So they walk out and they're walking down to the bus and they go, go to a nearby bench and they're or, starting to use it right there? That's what we anticipate. Are they allowed? And to that's do, what other are jurisdictions they allowed, are they allowed to do have that experience. Under, are they allowed to do that under the law? We do have a, uh, a prohibition against public consumption. Mm -hmm. However, there's no um, there's no teeth in the fine collection mechanism. So we can issue fines, um, and uh, mm -hmm. we could go up to somebody publicly using marijuana and ask them to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. They could say, "I'm Mickey Mouse." They don't have to give us a positive identity. We could give Mickey Mouse a hundred dollar citation, and there's no teeth in the law to collect that hundred dollar citation. Mm -hmm. So um, the the sponsors of the medical marijuana um, um, initial question, um, I would argue, intentionally put some loopholes in the in the um, in the ballot question. Mm -hmm. Can I think this is more for Christine? Maybe where are the private home daycares that are on this map? So those are mostly scattered. Um, are they the, all the orange dots, or are they, they a combination are, of yeah, the orange regular dots. day? Are they a combination of regular daycare and um, private home daycares? Yes. Yeah, the orange and dots. Do we know where all the private home daycares are? Yeah. What do they need to do to get licensed? Um, there's a, a license through the state, mm -hmm. um, and their their addresses are listed on the state website. So, let's say this does pass, mm -hmm. um, it would be easy enough to just pull those addresses. Mm -hmm. Anytime there's an applicant, and mm -hmm. um, plot them on a map and make sure that the, the site would work. Um, for the most part, those change, but they're further out. They're further into the neighborhoods, and so I don't think that they would have much of an impact. The home daycares, that is, mm -hmm. they would have much of an impact on um, you know the business district. 
just following up on that, um, would there be any mechanism uh, that if, for instance, somebody applied for a private home daycare license uh, and they were within 500 feet of a dispensary and they didn't care that uh, that, that uh, application would be denied in the interest of <coughs> protecting the children? I'm sorry, I'm so is there is it would the, is there any mechanism if we did if, if we do have the the 500 foot buffer zones and and someone living within the buffer zone decided despite the existence of the dispensary to seek a private home daycare license is there any provision for denying that on the on the no. basis of the presence of no. the dispensary no, there wouldn't be no it's a state license and we would have no authority to do that under this, if this were to pass. Yeah. So in some sense, um, you know, we can, we can achieve some of the aim by limiting where the dispensaries um, are cited, but we can't entirely control what, uh, what other activities involving children might choose to move into the buffer zone. Yeah. You know, my layperson perspective on this, and you all are, you know, subject matter experts in the, on, on this business, but it's it's about that date and time when the application is received and the analysis occurs at that point. Obviously, the world changes is moving forward, and I think that was the intent of the original 500-foot um, buffer zone um, that many other jurisdictions have. Um, you know, clearly things will change. You know, years or decades down the line, it's just like Water Street. If, if, you know, this is adopted by town meeting, they're exempted. How old are the children who go to the daycares that are on the dots? What are the age range? Um, they could be zero to five. They so could connect be. that to me mm -hmm. to what was said earlier about the age where the diversion happens is mm -hmm. 12. So I think and, when it comes... And up? Yeah, so when, so when it comes to the daycares, it's, it's the perception. So, you know... Children are going by, by this facility every day. And over time, it becomes normal. And the perception of harm and the perception of risk is low. So by the time they're 12, you know, it's, it's easier to engage. And that's really the, the concept behind that. And I think when we look nationwide, you know, the daycare centers are included in most of the buffer zones across the states that, that have medical marijuana um, you know, approved um, in, in the states. So I think when we look from a public health perspective, it's the perception of risk and the perception of harm that um, we want. We want those children to grow up believing that you know that's something that they're going to have to push off till later in life. Um, if they start between the ages of 12 and 17 with marijuana, we know that depression is more likely by the time they're 24. Um, the youth brain is developing up to 24, and you know there's a lot of science and a lot of research behind. Um, you know, really trying to push off the use of alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, um, till at least 24. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously the age of um, alcohol is 21, but we would obviously like to push that off as, as long as possible. But where we're seeing the age of use starting generally in Arlington, with marijuana at, at age 12, I think the longer we can push that off, the better. Um, you know, and, and so I think it is a great question. It is something that, that I was looking at. You know, why daycare centers? Why why would we care? And I think it's just the it's it's the going by these facilities every day and it becoming a regular part of life and seeing people going in and out that that allows them to over time uh, believe that it's it's an acceptable um, drug to use. And by the time they're twelve, it become it's just a normal part of life. If I could add on to that also, um, as Chief Ryan mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, there's only 168 people in Arlington that have prescriptions. Um, and as Christine mentioned and has been reported in, in the Boston Globe several times, it's laughably easily, easy to get a prescription. And there are physicians who have been arrested for giving out prescriptions to basically anybody who comes in their office, right? There was a Boston Globe expose about that, that physician who got arrested because anybody who came in his office, he gave them a prescription. Um, so we know that there are good people that will be going to these dispensaries. We also know that there will be bad people going to these dispensaries and that they will attract bad people. And that's just 
being adults about this, right, and, and recognizing the way the world works. Um, and I believe the dispensary has offered the town a certain amount of money every month uh, in exchange for, for this permit. And if you look at the sum of money that they're giving us, in order to pay for that amount of money, they're expecting a lot more than 168 people to be using this facility. So they're expecting a lot of people to be coming in from out of town. So that means that this facility will be drawing in people of ill repute from the surrounding communities. So now you're concentrating them in one particular place, and you're concentrating them in a place that's within 500 feet of a preschool. So now the risk right, of something bad happening to the children walking to this preschool has now been compounded. We're engaging in a social experiment here. We've never done this before. Let's go into it with our eyes open, being realistic about human nature, and trying to avert bad things instead of reacting to them after they happen. And just quickly, Mr. Chair, if I, to Mr. Benson's question to Christine, impaired driving is another uh, uh, major concern of the police department. Um, you know, those impaired by the consumption of, of marijuana as they go to get more marijuana and traveling by these daycares where there are children zero to five creates a uh, serious public safety risk. Combined with the fact is that um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a lack of an enforcement mechanism here. It's not, we don't have the standard field sobriety testing uh, that we have for alcohol impairment and the SJC is now uh, has a case under review where uh, we can use the uh, what's known as the horizontal gaze and nystagmus test to, to check for uh, um, marijuana impairment. But I do worry about impaired drivers in our neighborhoods. Get, getting back to um, the other point, for the places that have opened around the state, is there any evidence of increases in crime and lots of people of well, I don't know that anybody's collecting data on that. that. character of showing up at these right. places? Um, well, there's plenty of anecdotal stories, yes. Um, uh -huh. I don't know if anybody's collecting data on, you know, sort of baseline data and follow-up data on uh -huh. quality of life issues. That's one thing we've talked about internally with our crime analysts to, you know, sort of make sure we understand our baseline of activity around Water Street to be able to measure any change moving forward. That's that that's, uh, would be the responsible thing to do, but clearly we've, we've heard about anecdotes around the state, yeah. What have you heard? Uh, impaired driving. Uh -huh. yeah. From people who are using yes. medical marijuana or just people who are using Combination. illegal? Or how Combination. do we know it's medical as compared well, to... Well, you have to understand, sir, you know, you pull over a car, a carload of kids, one has a car, the others don't. Some give you fake names. Um, there's marijuana in the car. They know it's basically legal. Um, again, I don't mean to sound like a cynic here, but you know, um, this is what we deal with in the field, mm -hmm. and, and we would expect that to occur um, moving forward with dispensaries in Ireland. Thanks. Helpful. Go ahead. I, I do want to wrap this up because we're getting just, sorry. Outside, just, it's a good discussion. Just a couple. I, I just wanted to look at um, some of the definitions a little bit. Um, so, in in the current um, proposal. There are three categories that um, we're looking at the, uh, at the, the board chart, of, yeah, which was prepared for us, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So and, this is what you uh -huh. and yeah. also the I I think does does this so, yeah, track the board of health? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, that's, proposal. Yeah. That's the far yeah. right column. Okay. That's what there. I thought. Um, so um, there were th there are three categories that, if I read the key correctly. Uh, are not explicitly mentioned, but fall into other categories. And can can you just um, explain which categories those three fall under? And that's the facilities in which children commonly con congregate, licensed providers of educational, recreational, and healthcare services to children, and parks and playgrounds. Sure. So I'll start with parks and playgrounds. So the um, as proposed by the Board of Health, um, it says specifically uh, athletic playing fields where organized permitted events occur. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit more specific than parks and playgrounds. So it's, it's a subset of parks and playgrounds. So not, not all parks and playgrounds, only those with, okay. uh, with athletic fields where organized permitted events occur. Um, with respect to uh, 
licensed providers of educational recreational health care services, again, a subset of that is included, right? So licensed child care programs, residential care programs, public and private schools. So that's a, a subset of providers of educational services to children. And then facilities in which children commonly congregate is what was in the state law. And as we noted, that that's vague and needed definition. And so then the definition is what's what we have provided. Okay. That, that makes more sense. The way it was presented on the chart, it sounded like those categories were entirely subsumed by oh, the defined categories. Sorry, yeah, I should have, I should have said it's, it's a subset of that okay. is included. Um, and then my, my last question just had to do with uh, how the distance is measured in establishing the buffer zone. Um, uh, in the Board of Health proposal, it's uh, 500 feet measured in a straight line. Um, it, I don't know it, it, whether there's uh, whether there are other ways of measuring or what the best way of measuring is. So that is. was taken right out of the state, um, the original state regulation. So, I mean, you can obviously look at other communities um, to see what they've used. But I think taking it right out of the state reg, which is what we originally thought was in place in Arlington, was sort of the way that um, we thought was the best way to, to put this forward. Okay. okay. Any just, other questions? Just one thing. Go ahead. I just in the letter I just noticed that this the town had in, inadvertently voided the five. That may be true, but that's not the way I remember it. Um, I remember it as a that we were the town was going to be thinking about it themselves, given that we are Arlington. We're not like every other town. That was a guideline that the state had. But I don't think it was inadvertent. I think it was purposely in order to assess what 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 could happen and what the police department thought was a good idea. You know, uh, concentrations of businesses around the downtown might have been a good idea to have. That's where your surveillance is highest versus pushing it farther out. So maybe I'm wrong. I just want to. I just personally, I don't remember it that way. I didn't think it was inadvertent. So from the email. It says the town had inadvertently voided the 500 foot buffer zone. Yeah. I don't, I'm just saying, I don't know if that language is correct. That's a memo from Doug Heim? No, I think that that's, a, that's in oh, your okay. email to that. Okay. Uh, but now that I see what you're saying is that this kind of blunt instrument, I mean, I, I see the logic of it, is the way you think it's going to be the safest in this town, and that's, that, that rings very strongly. I mean, I. I my recollection is that when when town meeting voted on this, it was um, uh, town meeting took its vote, and then at a subsequent time, the state changed its interpretation, and and uh, that that kind of changed the impact of what town meeting had voted on. I think that's right, and that's my recollection that's from right. these discussions back in the fall. Is yep. that is that when the vote was taken at town meeting, it was. Sort of assume that certain things would be in place, and then the state yeah. pulled things away and said, "No, it doesn't." doesn't yeah. So I, I mean, in that sense, it was inadvertent. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Well, we'll have <clears throat> opportunity to ask more questions and get some more information next week. The public hearing. Look forward Thank to you it. So you will face a lot of questions from. Many other people, I'm sure. But thank you for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. understand you are the because at special town meeting you voted no action on something very similar to this only you can bring this back kind of similar to the discussion that we'll have about the, the bet, or that we already did have about the driveways because it was voted down by town meeting in other words the only entity that can bring this back 
to town meeting is the ARB. Otherwise, if you vote no action, then the no action continues. And um, for two years, basically. I think that's the timeline. And, Sorry, and I have to look at you. If you yeah. confirm. Can, can <laughs> I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Jane. If, if there is no action, what's our rule now? What, what does the town have if nothing changes? Then we, the we town have, has no buffer zone. No buffer. no buffer zone. So yeah. only the special permit process. Is only the, the special permit just, process. Just, and, the the and the board of health. And the board of health. Right. And, and actually the selectmen, too, the have selectmen. to go through the siting process. So, so it's, we it actually is. Still has a, a it's, a, it's a fairly problems. robust process mm -hmm. to go through, to choose an appropriate site, and to choose the, 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 <clears throat> the appropriate location in town. There are several checks on how that actually is sited. And I know from discussions that we have, back in the fall that the, the water <coughs> location okay. was was really one of the only one the only sites in town that every board that had a say in where it went felt was appropriate. And the reason that that was chosen was because of its proximity to, to town hall and its proximity to the police department and the fact that it is in a medical building so that there would be some surveillance capabilities, but also some peer pressure from the other people in the building and in the neighborhood to keep things on the up and up there. Yeah. We'll talk about it in, in further detail right. next week. And see what the public thinks. Let's see what the public thinks. So, okay. Special town meeting. Jenny. Actually, I'm going to turn to Laura in a moment, but um, this is, so special town meeting in your packet, you've got, I think basically a bunch of public hearing notices, <laughs> um, which I apologize were displayed in that way, but it was the easiest way to convey all of the zoning articles. So you've got um, ones that are for annual town meeting, and then you have one sheet that's for special town meeting, um, including the ones that we've talked about um, previous, in the previous discussion. So um, right now we're looking at the one that says public hearing zoning bylaw amendments, Article 1 zoning bylaw amendment definitions for open space usable. Um, the reason for this amendment actually came from the residential study group, which has been looking at the issue of, as you know, um, for annual town meeting, we're talking about um, driveway grades and garages. And uh, one of the things that the group had been talking about is some offering some sort of incentive uh, to get surface parking on lots rather than having garages at all. How could we potentially incentivize um, a, a builder or developer um, to put surface parking um, on a lot? And so one of the um, discussion points that, that emerged with the residential study group was making changes to open space. But it was thought of after we had already completed <laughs> the annual town meeting warrant article. So that's why it became a special town meeting warrant article. And it actually became necessary to achieve some of the things that the driveway bylaw intends to. I think that as well. Through. And so I'll let Laura speak to some of the more the technical side of it and also can answer, but either one of us can answer questions. If there's anything else that I missed. But, and, but do people already understand what the. We talked through Main. the driveways. Okay. The, um, the, I think last meeting. Okay. So this is to speak. one last change that would be is meant to be an incentive to, for developers to provide the parking on in the side yard as opposed to underneath in the front of the house. So um, one of the things, one of the requirements in the zoning bylaw is. Um, and I wish I had my bylaw with me because I don't remember the exact percentage, it's about 30% mm -hmm. of the area of the square footage of the house, the floor area, has to be open space on the lot. But in addition to that, this, the area has to be now basically 25 by 25, or a circle of 25 feet. A driveway cannot be included in your open space. So if we're asking people to put the driveway on the side and we're also asking them to put a buffer between the driveway and their neighbor, that cuts into that backyard area that can be used for open space. And so this, it doesn't decrease the total amount of open space on the lot, but it increases that circle, that contiguous circle from 20 to 20, from 25 to 20 
feet. So that con that contiguous area can be a little bit smaller. You would still have to provide the same amount of open space. If it wasn't there, it would have to be someplace else on the lot. So again, it's just meant to be an incentive to get people to do that side yard parking as opposed to the underneath parking with the steep driveways. Is that clear? Well, I think it's, I think it's yeah. very good. I've, I've like all zoning, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's very good. I think it's, it's a good article that encourages uh, what we've been trying to um, zone out by uh, the slope for the driveway. I think this right. this is a uh, way of not saying no, but a way of encouraging, it's an alternative. Yeah. saying, you know, and I think this is a very good thing, and then um, not having 25 feet, which is very difficult to do, and reducing it down to 20 feet is, is a very fair compromise. We'll have graphics to yes. display. Right? <laughs> yes. There so will be visuals so that they can be even better explained. David. So, um, I remember. I remember the discussion and, we were, and the pictures we were looking at. So, is is Article One for special town meeting just kind of an additional technical piece in order to implement everything we discussed? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It yeah. Is. This was this was an idea that came up as the residential study group got into the actual language of the other part of the driveway article and it. Yeah. Eight. And mm -hmm. so what was decided in that group was that incentivizing alternatives was necessary. But there right, had to and be I some, see right, that here. There had to be some reason for developers to want to go do these things instead of just keeping the status quo. Um, so yes, this is a, a technical change to ensure that everything proposed as part of Article 8 is available once yeah. July rolls around and these are put in force. So Article 8 says there, there should be incentives and Article 1 for special town meeting makes it possible for there to be incentives. Yes. That's so right. they're linked. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And okay. so we think, but can't be sure, that special town, special town meeting, I think, is the same night as annual town meeting. So, but in all likelihood, these things would be, will be discussed close, within close proximity to one another. So we can, you know, cross-reference. Although we'll be in different town meetings, technically. Yeah, I don't know if we. Can, <laughs> we I don't know if we, we technically can. We can, can, we can reference it, but we cannot bring it up and vote upon it until we get into that portion, mm -hmm. the special town meeting. So it'll be an interesting. We can linguistic make challenge. sure that, assuming we decide to go forward with these, that any presentation to the public before town meeting right. understands that they're intended to mesh. Right. Which one comes first? Sorry. This, uh, we'll probably have Article 8 first. So, can it, we it, it, Because we're going to have an annual town meeting, and I think that this is the first night in all likelihood, April 24th, we'll get to Article 8. And then, yeah. I don't know when special town meeting will begin. Well, is it after the regular town meeting? It's or do they? It's the day. second day. It's so the that's second day. Wednesday night. Why are they having a special town meeting? Um, there must be right. something on there that they don't answer that. Yeah. I, 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 actually, I don't have the full special town meeting warrant in the, front of me right now, but there are a number of articles. There's, all, there's, all, there's, oh, there's there always a special town meeting oh, there is? in conjunction with town meeting, oh, okay. pretty much. I, I mean, in the three years I was. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's not unusual. And it's so not just for this. If we support eight, then what happens if Article 1 doesn't get. Uh, means we don't have well, any incentives. One less incentive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were well, some well, incentives yeah, in Article like, Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I have, a, yeah. I have a couple of questions. One is, does this mean that there'll be less green space on the lots? And, or tell me how this works where you're allowing more cars to be parked on a lot. Well, we're not allowing more cars to be parked on a lot. We're, we're, we're trying to incentivize people put the driveway on the side like they always used to do instead of cutting into the basically the front yard mm -hmm. which is what many new developers are doing now so we think the the amount of driveway space will be the same and therefore we won't be losing any green space around the houses uh, well it could also the be the house. house. no, no, I, I think houses have to be smaller in order to yeah. accomplish the surface parking right. That yeah, that and does. so that's part of the reason that we've changed the, we're proposing to change the open space requirement, but what you're actually, what we think you're actually going to see is less of 
the, the heavy sloped, high sloped driveways down into a garage below surface level. Mm -hmm. And instead of taking that in the middle, especially with the two family homes that are going up on town, you separate those out. And so you actually ha will have more of a traditional front yard, many of these new constructions. We also lower the parking requirement. So, so we don't think an unintended consequence of this will be more impervious surface. Well, I, I, it could, there will be probably more concrete than, yes, than the driveways are very short when you have the driveway in the front. Right. But it's just, just cuts the street, you know, the street frontage is impaired. But it does also require the, the vegetation between property. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, there are other like landscaping requirements that I think we get for that. And again, mm -hmm. it's the visuals that we're talking about overall. Jean, I think, uh, one of the things that this does is it takes the, the square footage of the impervious in front of the house, puts it to the side. So the front of the house is more green. So um, the area that's facing the public has more green space because there's mm -hmm. no driveway in the front that goes down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what happens is now you, now you have more green space up front and it might be a little bit more impervious on the side that's not facing the public. And then what's, I think what Article 1 does is allow, uh, you're not reducing the amount of square footage of um, green space in the back, but it's just the, uh, the um, dimension of it. So the back of the house could be a little further back, but you can count the amount of square footage. Instead of saying it's uh, 10 by 10, you might go 8 by 12 or something like that. Would this allow people to do both? Would they then be able to have, let's say they build the house so the driveway surface level, can they then have, continue to have their front driveway and put a driveway on the side so they end up with that? You can only have one curb cut except by special permit right. and then you can have two right. curb so cuts. So they could have one go like, they could have right. like that and you'd end up with two driveways. One driveway but park a couple cars on the side of the house and a couple cars in front of the house. With one wide driveway? Yeah. You don't need it much wider than one car to be able to do that, I'm just wondering. It's an interesting thought of like what actually controls that. It may be the impervious, you know, the runoff issue that stops you from paving over your whole yard. Yeah, I think that that's where the... Because what you're saying is technically that's what you could do, right? Mm -hmm. But anybody can do that now, right? You're mm -hmm. Except they have, they can't necessarily do it on the side of that. And yeah, I think I think I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think that's offset by the amount of impervious material you can have, and then also, like Jenny said, the stormwater. Right. Yeah. But Steve, that's a good question. Uh, there's a question from the audience. Okay. Yeah, question. Uh, Steve Rebelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Will this generally reduce the minimum horizontal dimension of usable open space from 20 feet to 20 from 25 to 20 feet? Generally, what do you mean generally for every so so for, for example new home. Oh, for, okay, so for, for example, um, I live on a lot with no usable open space because the minimum horizontal dimension is 20 feet as opposed to not 25 feet. I'm wondering if I'm going to get open space if this passes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the reasons I think this could be interesting is um, like one of the, th uh, something I, I see come up at ZBA hearings is, um, you know, the discussion of pre-existing conditions where a lot has no usable open space. Mm -hmm. If you shrink the dimension, now the open space laws might apply to places where they did not apply before. Mm -hmm. Well, this does say newly constructed single two-family duplex or three-family dwellings. Okay. Yeah, this is limited. Okay. All right, thank you. Can, can we try to answer that question that Jean has? The unintended consequences? Whether it could result in more. Yeah. It's just, it would be good to know that. As it's a very really tough question to answer. It 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 yeah, it maybe it is, but it'd be interesting to try to see yeah, what other can. checks on that are existing. So we're in the met, uh, midst of doing like a sketch up of looking at possibilities, so we can measure the space mm -hmm. and the dimensions of a driveway, that kind of stuff. Well, if we see that there are one or more scenarios where what Gene's concerned about yeah. could could occur, can we still tweak the exact language to? As long as it's within scope uh, of the warrant. Not the warrant language. Not the warrant. But your vote. <laughs> yeah, the your language that we're proposing. That's right. Did we write the language? We did. Okay. Well, the warrant, as long as 
the actual wording mm -hmm. is within the scope of the Warren article, you can. There's there's leeway. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're not. I mean, obviously, we wouldn't be changing the Warren article. Is the, right. com is the committee yeah. meeting on this now? Yes. Yeah. Their next. Yes. Of course. Wednesday yeah. morning. <laughs> well, well, could that be brought up? I, I, I'm sorry. Once a week. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, it'll, it'll be discussed Wednesday. Yeah, would that be really okay? Wednesday morning. Then, then could we could that question be posed at that point to the study group? Yeah. I think probably it'll be more answered by staff, uh, but we can yeah. also talk about it with the study group. Can okay. add it to the mix. Just I'm just wondering, like, if what you're saying in your mind, Jean, is that. Um, one driveway would go under and one driveway would go here, or that the one driveway would go right in front of the house, because that actually is front yard parking. And that's no, I know, left. but if 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 Unless it's the a house garage. if the house has a garage, then they and they can drive that way. They can drive the other side. Contiguous, it would have to be next to each other. Exactly. Uh, I, I just Possibly. I just see that very what difficult to do because in order to get to garage the down below, you're going right. down okay. a no. grade. So if you were to take, before you get to the house, take a left or a right, you'd already down a certain grade already. So you're, right, so you're, but if, but if you're, but if your, if your garage is at grade, at grade, mm -hmm, yeah. at grade that's possible. We then can you possible. can, then you encounter, or if it's less than 15%, whatever, mm -hmm. is in eight, then you have the possibility mm -hmm. of doing both. I'm just trying to think of ways of saying you can't do that. <laughs> just and I, yeah, but I can think of ways where you yeah. can. That's, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good, very good question. Yeah. Staff. We'll, we'll look into it. Okay. I know troublemaker. My first time. Right. <laughs> <That's laughs> <That's laughs> that's 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 why you're here. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to join the residential study group? By the way. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. That's right. Yeah, no, I, I did tell him about all the meetings. So. <laughs> well, there, there are plenty of other committees he can join. <laughs> um, you don't want to. Um, okay, housing plan implementation committee. Moving on. Ah, yeah. yeah. Um, in your packet, you will see a memo um, that. Uh, well. To take a step back, the housing plan, housing production plan that we worked on last year, you approved it in June, the selectmen approved it in July, and the state approved it or adopted it. I guess we adopted it, they approved it in October. So we've had an approved housing production plan for a couple of months. Um, we wanted to set up a housing plan implementation committee to um, look at the recommendations and start to talk about how we're going to implement some of them, um, if not all of them. And um, so I asked everyone who had been on the Housing Plan Advisory Committee if they wanted to stay, and four people said that they did, and that is in this memo, the first four people on that list. Um, and then I advertised on the town website and in the advocate for more members and got four more people interested. So um, we have a committee of eight that I would like to ask you to um, approve their working under you, since you, you um, oversaw the housing production plan, the implementation will also be under you. Um, the people that were on the committee before are Lori August, who is the social worker with the Council on Aging and obviously has a lot of concerns about um, elderly housing and, and um, aging in place and aging in community. Um, Pam Hallett is the Executive Director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Pamela Baldwin, who works at, I, I actually made a mistake here, she works at the Graduate School of Design, not the Harvard Joint Center, but she had been at the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies for 20 years and has a lot of um, connections there. And she's also on the HCA board. And Kate Casa, who is an affordable housing consultant. Um, the four new people we got were, um, and I've I've spoken with all of them, and they all have a lot of housing experience um, and community experience. Patrick Murphy, who's a high school teacher in Chelsea, but a former uh, Lowell city councilor and mayor, um, and very interested in, in community organizing, I guess you could say. Um, Catherine Levine Einstein, who is a political science professor at BU, 
Ann Woodward, who is a self-employed nonprofit management consultant with housing experience, among other types of experience, and Samara Clayman, who is the director of the Brooklyn Improvement Coalition, which is their community development corporation. There, so it's a really, it's a very strong group that I'm excited to start working with. Do we want to vote on it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, move to accept the recommendations of the planning board. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, it's the staff. The staff for um, new members of the Housing Plan Implementation Committee, as described in the memorandum, March 6, 2017. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, one thing I forgot to tell you is that I've also reached out to the Housing Authority to see if anyone, either on their board or staff, would be interested in joining the group. I have not heard back yet, but I hope to. And if anybody um, on this board is interested, please let me know. <laughs> well, we're at our group. <laughs> it's possible to get a tenant from one of the places on it? From the Housing Authority? Or from some subsidized housing? Well, at least one person on this is a tenant. Oh, they are? Um, okay. Not, not in affordable housing. Yeah, I was wondering. Okay. We did have a tenant of HCA at the housing plan advisory level, uh -huh. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that person was helpful mm -hmm. in some of the discussions. I think that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Sorry, David, were you fantastic? No, no. Okay. I'll see what I can do. Okay. We get to get something for it. Great. Yeah. Zoning reconfiguration update. Yeah. All right. Um, so in your packet, you have two different documents that may look the same. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> They're addressed to different directors, if that helps. <laughs> um, one is on the top, which is a recent memorandum from RKC Associates um, to myself and Laura um, from Judy Barrett. And it is, um, the subject is Arlington Zone Review and Reorganization Framework. And then the second one, just for reference, is the, um, what has been called the Zoning Audit. It's an appendix that you can find in the master plan. I just provided that to you as a point of reference because one of the first tasks for RKG as part of zoning recodification is to update the audit. So this is technically the update to that audit. So that was why I put the two in there. Um, and then I would just say that this, so this document was actually delivered um, to the zoning recodification working group last week. Um, and discussed at that meeting, and we had our representatives from RKG at the meeting talking with us, and um, we had, you know, lots of questions. We also talked about the timeline, um, which, as you know, is marching along, um, including we are hopeful that we'll have some sort of first reading in the next few months, and that we would actually have um, a public forum in July. I think we chose a date. I'll get that to you. Um, and then we would have this, uh, the final public forum would be in September so that we can get to a special town meeting, obviously. So that, that's, that's always been the goal, uh, to have a special town meeting in the fall to adopt a new amended zoning bylaw. So the, the purpose of the memorandum is really just summarizing, you know, again, the things that they found that are not working, including, you know, looking literally piece by piece. Um, article by article, um, and in some cases, really drilling down quite deeply into things that need to change. I would just say that I think some of these things are new, but then the old memorandum still many of the things that are in here still hold true as well. You know, so you could use you could basically go back and look at the two together. Um, and I guess the only other thing that I want to say to kick up the conversation is. Um, They've made a suggested framework for reorganization of the zoning bylaw, and I think that um, this is a very good time for you to look at the suggested framework and provide any feedback to staff or to the zoning recodification working group, because now is basically the time where we, we are going to start writing, rewriting things. Um, so we, we've we did have feedback from the zoning recodification working group, but I think it's appropriate for you to also think about 
you know, the organization of the zoning bylaw. And if you could reorganize it, what would it look like? Um, so some of the things that we've talked about, for example, are taking um, signs out of the zoning bylaw, which is a conversation that we've had, I think, over a number of years, and now with the more recent changes to sign permits and approvals at the actually at the Supreme Court level, um, it's there's definitely an impetus to change the way that we do sign approval process here in town. Um, so that might be a, like a parallel process where we make amendments to the town bylaw because there's also a process in the town bylaw about sign permitting. Um, there's also a lot of administrative and sort of um, things that are like practices that we need, that we, if we take them out of the zoning bylaw, we are able to amend them a lot more easily. And by practices, I mean how we administer the zoning bylaw, how we administer the special permit process, things of that nature. There's a lot in the zoning that could be out of the zoning. So that's part of this whole cleanup initiative and also potentially reorganization. Um, did I miss anything that anybody else who's participated in this process thinks is important for the rest of the board members to know about? And I know Steve's in the room. He's also a member of no, the working group. Well, one, uh, one thing that uh, is in here that you may or may not have noticed is re reframing um, what we do um, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, in environmental design review to site plan review. Yes. Um, which is more consistent with current practice. Yeah. You mean generally, outside of our or with what we're doing? Are you saying it's no, generally, outside of our Yeah. But it is also the practice that you, you're, you're, generally speaking, that is what you are practicing. You're doing a site plan review. Not exactly, but mostly. Right. So, yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I... I don't know if I missed anything else, though, that anybody else wants to share. About yeah, I do process. want to ask one thing. When I was reading through this quickly, maybe I didn't quite understand it. On the non-conforming use and structures. Which page? Uh, in the suggested framework. Oh, okay. Well, it could be that, but also I read it actually in, um, I think you're right, Andy Page. Uh, oh, I saw Andy Page, page for suggested framework. It was um, uh, H5. It's right at the bottom, the general comment. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I read somewhere where it said something like it was the goal to eliminate or um, get rid of these non conforming um, spaces or structures. Lots. Lots, yes. Yeah, lots. And I just want to say that, you know, half of. Um, I think the entire town is not conforming. Yes, yes. and so yeah. I don't think we're talking. I don't think we're going to go down that road. But yeah, I, and that's I why I was. Think that that's that's not a thing. Because you know what, every town is like that. Uh, every yeah. older town. Is yeah, like I, that. Yes. one of the things that we've talked about in the residential study group is how something like one percent of lots in Arlington are actually <laughs> appropriate for language in the zoning. Everything else is not conforming use. So that's that's not something we're. But I think that they're, um, what they're talking about is looking at recent case law. This goes back to the earlier zoning audit, mm -hmm. which um, talks about a case out of Norwell from 2008, um, and more recent appeals court decisions that might have a bearing on an update to Article 9. So I think what she's talking about is she wants to sit down with planning and building and inspectional services, rather, to talk through the impact of those that recent case law and cases in court. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this. Maybe in the old, yeah. in the 2014, so, but something to look at. Okay. Was there another? That was pretty much it. I just <laughs> looked at that and read that and I'm like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. um, Steve, as long as you're here, Steve, is there anything I, you'd like I to add? I think you've, uh, Steve Rowlock, 111 Sunnyside Avenue, I think you guys have uh, covered ev everything that um, I remember. The only thing I saw from a very quick look, and I didn't have a chance to compare this to the bylaw, I was a little surprised that um, they put accessory uses and special regulations as compared to maybe the use regulations. So I was just wondering if that was the best place 
to have put it in, in, in the reorganization. That, that was the only thing that jumped out at me, mm -hmm. really, in looking mm -hmm. at, at this. Uh, yeah, we have a mic. I'll ask them. Yeah. And that's a decision that hasn't been made. It right. hasn't been put anywhere yet. Yeah. So these, this is a suggested framework. Right. And, and there may be good reasons to have it there, yeah. but when, when I've looked at you know, zoning bylaws, you sort of want to see the uses and then see the accessory uses. Right. In the same area. That was the only thing that occurred to me. Okay. But maybe the standard practice is to have it somewhere else. I'll see. To find out. Okay. All right. So I mean, I think we we wanted to have this discussion because want to make sure that you're all, you're all up to speed on what's happening with zoning recodification, especially before town meeting, where there's going to be discussions about zoning changes and zoning amendments. There's a a zoning warrant article about um, uh, changing a, a residential district from. Uh, R2 to R1, for example. I mean, there, there are things that are um, coming up and that will be at town meeting, but I just want to make sure you have an understanding of where we, where things are, how things are moving along the recodification process and how they may or may not relate to that process. That rezoning is not sponsored by them. No. No. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a resident initiated article which is 10 but you still have to have a public hearing about it so you will be having so, a public hearing, so, we'll a public hearing so after the public yeah. hearing then we would we would make a recommendation so or, you or, oh, go, ahead. <laughs> yes, go ahead okay so the on on the 13th is the public hearing on the regular town meeting articles on the 20th is the public hearing on this open space and um what's the second one the moratorium the second one, the moratorium and then the 20th, the 27th is when you'll vote on both, on and all of them. And probably also vote on a draft report to town meeting, because it seems like we might not make it to April 3rd. We might have to revise the schedule. Um, oh, yeah, we might be down to members. So these next three weeks are pretty critical. <clears throat> the three weeks are, yes, they're very critical. They became more critical. <laughs> it's a good thing we scheduled all the meetings. Me too. I can't make it before. Yeah, April. Yeah, fourth. Oh, so we have to we have to move it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. April. We have another April off. <laughs> yeah. Because we need four. Except for town meeting. Except for town meeting. Except for town meeting. Right. I'm sorry. What we need one more four then, right? That's why. No, actually, I thought you needed three. Well, I think now that we have five, we could have we could have three votes, but I think it's important for all of you to vote on the report to town meeting. Um, that is your voice at town meeting, technically. <coughs> so that, that's what we're talking about, is the vote on your report that goes to town meeting. So we'll, we'll accelerate that process. I don't think that there's any problem with that. Well, the, the, I mean, I suppose we can amend it at the table. Exactly. Because we can't know ahead of time what your vote is going to be. So no, but I we're think we're going to take a stab at it. And and we'll and say we'll as amended, it. and we'll, yeah. we'll figure out a way to distribute it thereafter without having a meeting so that we can submit it to the individuals that need to receive it in a prompt in a timely way. We, we don't have any other meetings scheduled before town meeting, so unless you want to schedule a different meeting date. So sorry to get sidetracked right there. Someone might have to get it off. I might have to not be on Monday if we need it to end on Monday. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, director's report. Um, so this is a very quick report. I think now we've really drilled down that we have an annual and special town meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm repeating myself. Um, but I wanted to bring to your attention, in case you don't already have the warrant, I think I provided that to you at a previous meeting, but now the official warrant, I gave you like an unofficial warrant. The official warrant is on the town meeting page of the town's website. So feel free to go to that for reference. Um, but I wanted to give you kind of just a taste of all of the different types of things that people in the Planning and Community Development Office have been working on related to town meetings. So they are things that we've been talking about, but then there's also other things like um, we are discussing a parking benefits district. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions about that. Uh, we always have an endorsement of the Community Development Block Grant application. 
Um, and then we're also going to have, in relation to zoning recertification, we need to request an appropriation for additional funds to hire a consultant for the policy type of work that we've talked about wanting to do to get the, the zoning aligned with the master plan. So, um, so those are the kinds of things that are coming up that I just wanted to keep um, keep you up to date on. And then we also updated the the schedule that's also been distributed at a previous meeting. It includes now all of the residential study groups meeting dates in March. Um, as well as a public forum that they are holding to discuss their uh, various articles that they're proposing on April 6th. And then lastly, um, just a quick thing, uh, we were able to uh, secure the services of a consulting conservation administrator who happens to be a former Conservation Commission member, um, Eileen Coleman, and I've put in my report for office hours in the event that you have any questions about that. Um, she'll be working for the town on a consulting basis through the end of this fiscal year, and then if everything goes according to plan, be able to hire a full-time environmental planner in the next fiscal year. So, that's my report. So, in April, yes. uh, are any of the previously scheduled meetings now off the schedule? So, we could not meet on April 10th because it's a holiday. Ah, we can't meet on April 17th because it's a holiday. So the only meetings that we had scheduled in April were April 3rd and April 24th. Um, it seems like we are, are only going to have three people here on April 3rd, which to me does not make for the best voting situation, um, particularly on a report that has to get to town meeting. Mm -hmm. And the report is due, as you can see here, April 11th. April 24th, you are going to meet probably for a half hour and then adjourn to town meeting. <laughs> that's, that's, that's basically your meeting on April 24th, um, unless you want to meet earlier. But yeah, I thought you said April 6th. That's the that's a, public forum. That's the public forum. I'm, I'm, I'm okay sorry. April 3rd. Oh. Oh. I apologize. Wow, the whole world just turned. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard you say April 6th. Can we rewind that? <laughs> why did you, why did I think April 6th? Because there's a public forum. Because there's a lot of meetings. It's, it's, I can do April 3rd. Sorry about that. Totally. Okay. All right. So, so April, we need to. April 3rd. So April is your 3rd, meeting. we still have, but not April then 10th we'll keep or April 17th. 3rd, but Jean will not be here. I will not be here. I'm sorry to Prior say. Obligation. But you can yeah. vote on the, you'll be here to vote on the actual, um, the, the motions and the, right. the votes right. that we're going to take. And we can run the draft by you, too. I mean, we'll run the draft by everybody ahead of time. You can get us comments. And should we be at the public forum on the 6th if we can be? I think that would be great if you can be. You, you're, it's not, I did not make it a requirement um, or anything like that. It's not an additional meeting for you, but they will be talking about um, the two warrant articles that are technically, one of them is being proposed by the redevelopment board which is Article 8. But the majority of time, I have a feeling they're going to talk about the construction control agreement stuff, which is all the town bylaw amendments. Mm -hmm. right. So um, that does obviously does not fall into your purview. But they would, of course, still enjoy your support, as you know from previous meetings with them. Yes. So any other questions about my report? No. Yeah. Anything else? We um, we don't have meeting minutes. <laughs> we had we we received the um, so right now the way that it works with the meeting minutes is our administrative assistant views the recording that ACMI does at every one of your meetings and then takes the meetings the, the meeting minutes from the office. Um, She's, we are now talking about her actually attending our meetings so that she can not only view the recordings but have you know, a better sense of the interactions and um, take better meeting minutes. Um, so she will be here next week, for example, and probably in the weeks after that um, to, to take meeting minutes. But we did not get the recording from ACMI until like 
I think it was late on Friday, was or at some point on Friday when it was posted. So she did not have the time. That was a long meeting, our last meeting. So she has not been able to complete those meeting minutes, which is why they're not on your agenda. Um, but I'm telling you this for two reasons. One is, I'm sorry you don't have the meeting minutes, because I think that's helpful to look back at what you talked about. But also, second thing is, you should anticipate that um, the administrative assistant will be attending future meetings in an effort to provide um, improved minutes and summaries for the meetings. One thing, yes. Jenny, um, you were out of town when I emailed you oh. um, that I may not be able to be here on the 27th. On the 27th, yes, I saw that. Yes, and that's still a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I think it looks like that's when we're going to finalize the votes on March 27th. Um, we can do it with four people here, but I don't, I don't see how we can move that up because you won't. Um, well, let me ask you a question. You're having your public hearing on March 13th next week on all the zoning, right, um, for annual town meeting. Would you feel comfortable voting by March 20th, the following week? And then we can move. The way, well, the way we've done it in the past is we have the public hearing. Yeah. We vote at the next meeting. It just happens that we've been on an every, every other week schedule. I'd be comfortable voting on the 20th, so long as. For annual town meeting. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you could vote on the night of the hearing if you wanted to. It is the tradition to vote to at win. another meeting. Yeah. I don't know why, though. Well, I think it gives. That's up to you. Yeah. In other words, you wouldn't, if you, if you can't be here on March 27th, then you'd be, only if you moved the special, the annual town meeting votes up a week, you would only miss the, an, uh, sorry, special town meeting vote. However you want to do it. I, I'm comfortable voting on town meeting articles with, with one week. Like Laura said, we could vote that night if we wanted to. Okay. Well, the week after. Right. Week after. Yeah. I, I think usually something happens between. Yeah, there are things we, that can change. We have a vociferous meeting, and then there are some cleanups that we sometimes do. Sometimes there are edits. Edits the votes. And mm -hmm. everybody feels a little more comfortable, let the dust settle for a minute, and then yeah. we have a meeting. And then we'll ask for mm -hmm. additional comment to be supplied via email or right. mail. Mm -hmm. um, but a week is still more than enough time for mm -hmm. people to weigh in on things. There's really only one article that hasn't been discussed, and that's true. You mean the residential yep. change? Yeah. Everything else has been known by the board up through tonight, where we've had the discussion about the, the buffer zone. Mm -hmm. So I'd be I'd be comfortable voting on the twentieth on those articles. Okay. So there's the moratorium too. The, the on the special time meeting, there's the so map. that's so that's the following right. and that's no what marijuana. you would have four here but not five. Yeah, so, so we vote good. on town meeting. We have a hearing for the town for town meeting on the 13th, vote on the 20th. We have a hearing for special town meeting on the 20th, vote on the 27th. Right, and mm -hmm. just that day that won't be on the 27th. Yeah. Possible. Possible. Oh, it's still possible. I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I think. <laughs> I think it's important to have all five members voting yeah. on those articles. The other two are yeah, are important, but are less. They they haven't been through the board to the same degree the others have. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I can certainly weigh in on recommended votes. And I'm I'm still trying to work out the schedule. I I have to be in Chicago early the next morning. So okay. depending on when I have to. May impact uh, whether I can be here on the night of the twenty seventh. Light out, Logan. First thing in the morning. <laughs> That's <laughs> probably not early enough. <laughs> but we definitely we're keeping the, the April third meeting. Let's keep the April third meeting. Let's keep the April third meeting. Everything worked for the April third. Let's keep the April third meeting for the report. It doesn't okay. work out. Even though Gene can't be here. That's well, fine. You own the pack. Yeah. Okay. Nothing else. 
Someone, please. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.